All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to session two. Uh, this is uh, relocating non traditional archives, and we're very excited to have uh, staff with us today from uh, Gallaudet University here in Washington. Uh, on my left uh, is Jim McCarthy, and on my right is uh, Paige Watson and Jared Grill. Uh, they will be presenting to us on how they uh, managed to relocate their uh, archives uh, at Gallaudet. Uh, and assisting us with us today, and I've already been warned that they didn't want to do this, but I'm doing it anyway, uh, with the ASL interpreters. Again, on my uh, left is uh, Victoria, and uh, here at the table uh, are Cody and Cynthia, and they will be um, voicing the presentations of uh, Jim, Jared, and Paige. And so at the end of the presentations, any questions that you people have, uh, I will be walking around with the microphone so that we will be able to ask them questions and then uh, they will be able to respond to you in the, in the same manner that they will do for their presentations. Uh, so I'm, I'm personally, I'm looking forward to this presentation and for nothing else, I want to know what the ASL interpretation of archives is. So I want to know what that means. Uh, so Jim, take it away. <coughs> Hi, good morning, everybody. So as was mentioned, I'm Jim from Gallaudet, and I manage the archives there. We recently went through a pretty significant relocation project. And I just want to clarify when we say non-traditional, that's because we don't have typical archives at Gallaudet University only. We also have a depository for deaf culture and history, um, specific things regarding the deaf community in the United States for the last 150 years. So we have sort of a parallel system where we have you know, our own school and our own social organizations, news newsletters, our own communications and history, all of those artifacts. So we've collected a lot of things from that system. It also includes furniture, artwork, uh, sculptures, video and film, all these various things uh, were really closer to a museum collection than an archive collection in many ways. So this does present some challenges. So the first tip that I have here for you guys, I'll show that on the slides. So it's important to keep this in mind when you're going through a project like ours. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> if you must, then, I mean, obviously, you'll, you'll have to. Uh, but so this is what we've learned from our process and our relocation. So we're going to split this kind of into three different parts. The first uh, section is preparing the collection for its transfer, identifying a new home, and then providing access for our patrons. So the first a person to speak will be Jared Grill. He's our preservation specialist. So take it away, Jared. So I'll be giving a little bit of context about the Gallaudet University's archives and then how we process, went through the process of inventory and packing. So Gallaudet University was founded, uh, or, or, uh, was founded in 1967, uh, our archives, mm -hmm. and that was done by Lucille Pendel, um, who is the head librarian of Gallaudet University, um, and who also used to work here at the National Archives in the 1950s. Um, so they founded this, uh, these archives for our institutional memory, and then years later, we added the repository of collections relating to deaf culture and language, and it really expanded from there. And then we moved to the Merrill Learning Center, another facility or another building in 1980. Um, so we had the archives in the basement. It was a mix of library and uh, technical services um, for the building. Initially, we had two uh, large storage rooms and it was designed for temperature control, um, inventory and shelving numbers, security. And our collection really grew and expanded past that. So we added another two rooms for storage. 
And those two rooms were not designed for archiving or for storage. They were not you know, temperature controlled. We had several issues like leaks. Uh, there was actually some flooding. Some critters got in there. Um, we also had a pretty serious mold or severe mold outbreak there. That, so we faced these situations there at our library. And then Gallaudet University finally got a new head librarian who started the process of upgrading our library and our collection. We had an initial plan for renovation of that library area on the first floor and the basement. And we were not planning to, or to renovate. Um, renovate the archives. We just wanted to do that area. And a few other things came up unexpectedly. Um, we had an archivist who uh, retired, who was really just a walking encyclopedia of knowledge. We had COVID, of course, so the university was closed and everybody was you know, working and learning from home. And so Gallaudet University, the campus, was kind of abandoned during COVID. We had a really severe rainstorm and we, the drainage ended up getting uh, backed up. So we had some flooding in the archive area and that really triggered the decision to uh, close that area and required us to move out of MLC, of the Merrill Learning Center. So initially, we had to change the schedule, change the plans for the building and we did not have a comprehensive inventory. We only had uh, smaller, like partial inventories. So when I joined, there was no official comprehensive inventory. So we had to start that process. From March 2020 to November 2020, we were all working from home. So we were having Zoom meetings and conferences uh, every week um, for how we would implement this inventory, what we should include, what we should not include, and at that moment, we really didn't have any experience with you know, relocating our archives. We're just starting from scratch. Um, so we went to SAA, the Society of American Archivists uh, Conference, and there were two uh, speakers there, one from Library of Con Congress and one from the University of Nebraska, who gave some presentations on how they relocated their collections. And those two presentations really helped us a lot. We learned a lot from them. They gave us a lot of resources to help with our move and our relocation. So through this process, we went through the discussion of what we should include, you know, accession numbers, um, different collections, and all those sorts of things we discussed. Um, shelf numbers, what we should include, what we shouldn't include, um, and to see what would be the most beneficial items to keep in the collection, what was not as beneficial. And so on, in February 2021, uh, Gala was fairly restricted. They were not really allowing people to come on campus. Um, so we reached an agreement. We were able to come on campus once a week, just at the beginning. Um, so we would rotate staff members, because we only had three archivists at the time. So each of us would rotate week after week. And then the COVID limitations became a little more flexible. Um, so we were able to work every day in a week. Um, one staff member would be in one room, another staff member would be in another room so we could practice social distancing. And then in March, 2021, our new director, Jim, joined us. And he really got the ball rolling, um, got things going a lot faster um, with that relocation process. So once we had completed the inventory, we had added barcodes to each of the boxes and labels of the, you know, that's property of Gallaudet University and so on and so forth. So then we had to start prioritizing. We were moving things to three different locations. Uh, the first one was just an interim archives in another building that was still on campus. Another one was the warehouse. Um, Jim will talk a little bit more about the warehouse location. And then the WRLC, the Washington Research Library Consortium, um, they have a shared collections facility. And we were, have already been a member of the consortium f for about 30 years. Um, it involves a lot of uh, different res uh, research organizations and universities in the DC area and in Maryland. 
So we decided what was going to the interim room, what was going to the warehouse, and what was going to the SCF. Um, and that was based on demand, how often people used those items in the collection. Some had already been digitized, so that could you know, be moved to a different place. Um, it was the sort of prioritization we went through. So then we started packing the boxes. And we used a strapping machine to keep the um, boxes you know, closed and, and all ra tightly wrapped up. We'd placed the items on pallets and created pallets out of these. And most of them were going on a shelf, um, so it was fairly easy to pack that. Sometimes as we w went through our inventory, we would have to count each individual item um, because we had a lot of loose objects that were out there on the shelf. So we had to pack that up in a box and then get a new inventory count, wrap that up, and then pack it uh, and palletize it. So this includes things like furniture. Um, we ended up having almost 200 pallets. It took about a year to pack and move all of this. Um, so luckily, our staff of three expanded up to six at that time. Um, so we had little rotations of, of two hours uh, every day um, for how many months? Was it nine months? It was nine or 10 nine or ten months um, of this packing. So it became kind of quite monotonous at times, um, but we really got to see a lot of objects that we maybe hadn't seen before. Um, so it was an interesting process. And we also had um, objects, um, like as Jim mentioned, were almost more of a museum collection. So for example, a TTY, uh, it's a teletype um, relay, teletype writer. Um, so deaf individuals used uh, that in the in the past. It was almost the size of a mailbox. Um, we'll we'll have uh, you know a picture of that. Um, there's a lot of things that were very heavy. Um, some like furniture pieces, uh, crafts, and theater props, things like that. So packing those was somewhat of a challenge. We had to do it in a different way. Some had to be done entirely in bubble wrap, um, and then you know labeled with their number and barcode outside to keep on the outside of that wrap to keep track of the items. And all of the art as well. We have around 3,000 items uh, relating to or from deaf artists. So getting those wrapped up in the bubble wrap, uh, covered and protected, and then moved to a special palletization uh, process. Um, so there's about 15 pallets worth of art that were brought to the warehouse. And we had to pack that up in a specific way so that we could keep track of everything and track all of the pieces. So in short, what we learned is the comprehensive inventory is really important. Um, it was very beneficial to get all of those pieces counted in that inventory. And this includes uh, like donations. Um, we'd have to get, you know, identify each of these individual pieces. Um, previously, we'd have to identify each thing individually that was donated. We want to also prevent backlog because we do have a significant backlog. So we've learned that that when we receive new donations or new additions to the collection, we want to do a sort of pre-processing to reduce that workload. And then for packing as well, uh, when we were packing, we saw a lot of duplicates. We saw some things that were not really valuable to research or valuable to our history um, that did not need packed. So we were able to downsize a little bit before palletizing. Um, it's maybe around 10 pallets or so that we saved that way. So um, we learned from that to sort of update our policies um, you know, and not become just sort of a you know, garbage repository. Um, we wanted to become more strict with our donations to get meaningful things into our collection. And so with our new director, we visited, revisited those policies um, and how we you know, make our acquisitions and accept donations. So obviously, over this process, it took about two years. We became very familiar with our collection in a way that had never happened before at our institution. So to give some idea of the total volume, there's around 30,000 cubic feet, um, or 15,000 square feet, um, between 80 to 120,000 individual objects in our collection. 
So it's really out of proportion to the size of our institution. Um, and that really gave some interesting challenges um, when we were relocating both to the interim and to the permanent space for our location choices. So we first had to find a new home for the collection. So the first law really is location. We were very fortunate that through our partners with uh, WRLC, the Library Research Consortium, we were able to rent some additional space for our collection in their shared collection facility. And the shared collections facility is pretty enormous. Um, it's nine universities collections. Um, but still, we were able to only find space for half of our collection. Uh, so that was the first and easiest step. Second part was looking for a place that would still be accessible for the remaining 50% of the collection. So we tried to look on campus to identify locations for that. So a little bit of history. And the from the 1940s through the 60s and 70s, um, there was an outbreak of German measles. And a typical result of that is that a person who is pregnant who contracted the disease, it would cause deafness in their child or in their infant. So there was also an outbreak of spinal meningitis around the same time. If a child caught that, uh, one of the lasting effects was deafness. So from the 50s through the 80s, we experienced a quite significant increase in the number of deaf individuals who are seeking college degrees. So during that period, Gallaudet was just expanding wildly. Uh, we doubled the size of our campus. We had a lot of new dorms, uh, new facilities that were being built. So we really just expanded the campus. So we could leverage that previous work in this case. Uh, the numbers for enrollment uh, dropped off and they did not raise again. So we had a lot of space on campus that we thought, hey, this would be great. We could avail ourselves of this space that's already there for some of our storage needs to house the remaining 50% of our collection. But again, because of the age of the buildings and other factors, um, other financial issues, uh, maintenance issues that did cause some issues for these buildings um, where they were not really suitable for that storage. Um, in one case, there was space available that was shared with uh, electric and uh, data like infrastructure um, where temperature control was impossible. We would have had to replace the HVAC system for the entire building to make it work, which was just fi not financially feasible. Another space we identified, we thought it would be great. It was an old dorm. Most of the spaces were all vacant. Um, and we were going to take over one floor of that, um, but it turns out the building was slated for demolishment. So um, we had to look for a uh, space off campus. So you know, the DMV area is quite expensive. And any available space is going to cost a lot of money. So the first thing that we had to make sure of for the space was that it would fit our bu budget. Luckily, we already had some funding available for us to use um, through the library. But it was intended for just basic renovations, so it was not a lot of money. So we had to look to see what we could find with that. And at the same time, we needed to make sure that the location was accessible to staff. Uh, my team and most of us live in Northwest DC. Um, Montgomery County is you know, kind of northwest of D.C., but Montgomery County is expensive. <laughs> so there was that factor. And in, in addition to that, we needed space because we needed people to be able to work remotely from that, that area. So those were our priorities we had to juggle. And we were very lucky to find one space. It's in PG County. It's a great option there, um, if you don't mind the drive. Um, you know, living in the DMV, we like the drive, right? The drive is awesome. <laughs> so this warehouse is around 8,200 square feet. 
It's got 14 offices that we uh, took down. We left four of them there and had the rest as open space. And it's several, or near several large highways. And the best part is it's right next to WRLC's uh, shared collection facility. So it's very easy to get between the two locations. One thing that we learned there in PG County and for most of the areas in the, around DC is planning, zoning, and permits, and code enforcement means that takes about six months of paperwork for four weeks of construction. So that's important to keep in mind if you're planning your, out your schedule. Um, make sure it's flexible if, you know, it all depends on whether somebody's in the office that day or not, whether something will get done on time. So we started moving uh, in March 2023. And this uh, photo here is part of our storage space. It's pretty nice open you know, floor plan. You can see everything. We'll speak a little bit more about how this location has impacted our relationship with our collection and what that means for us in the future. I'll speak about that a little bit later. Um, for now, we're going to discuss some of the uh, tough things that was actually Paige's job. So I'll turn it over to Paige. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Paige Wilson and I'm the collection archivist at Gallaudet University. And when I got on campus, this process had already been initiated. So I actually jumped in at sort of the end part of the inventory process. So I was learning my job, learning you know this new uh, project that was already underway and engaging with a new team. Next. We had about four sites, uh, two on campus and two off, that we had to take care of, including the shared facility. And, uh, you know, so I had to integrate, again, learning their ways of uh, archiving and records keeping and, and tracking and integrating that into our systems. So there was a lot of in-depth work that had to happen in terms of accessibility and making sure that the inventory was clear and aligned with what they expected before we even could initiate the move. Our use of campus space on campus, these uh, two locations that were on campus were perhaps, I mean, not even a half or a fourth of the size of our, our needs, but we had to uh, reassess sort of the processing of everything before it moved off campus and uh, what we were keeping at the warehouse and the shared facility to keep it all organized and uh, aligned. So this was the first piece that we did. Oh, sorry, let me jump back for just a moment. There's one other point I wanted to make. No, not that far, sorry. <laughs> I, I did want to show you this picture. This is the uh, shared facility. I don't know if you've seen it before, but this is actually uh, a, a true picture of where our records are, and you can see how high it is. So uh, it really does require a forklift to get all the way up to the top if you need to retrieve something or put something up there. So it's a pretty cool facility. Thanks. Next. Um, so initially, <laughs> this is what we found when we came on, when I came on campus anyway, this is what I walked into. Uh, these were the resources that were available to me. And on campus, we had these kinds of files. This is a reading room, and you can see, uh, you know, it's definitely not been inventoried. I mean, there were just things kind of everywhere. There was no spreadsheet. When I came in and I opened a, a drawer, it, you know, it was just really um, untouched for so long. And and there were paper filing systems and nothing was electronic. So it took quite a lot of work. And when we realized the scope of it, you know, there were only two staff who were really processing any of this. And so there was, you know, it was just insurmountable for them to kind of take care of the inventory alone. So we had to kind of divide and conquer some of the tasking so that we could make sure that we uh, were able to modernize all of the inventory and, and we shared the workload. It was pretty interesting. So in the warehouse, um, we had to complete that inventory and those boxes before we moved it. We didn't want to have to re-inventory once we had everything there on those shelves. You know, we wanted to know where it was going and make sure that the barcode was completely aligned. We didn't want to change the location or rework. So some of those files that we had there, you know, we had file cabinets, we had artwork, which Jim and Gerard have already talked about, and furniture, so uh, the same kinds of things that we had to deal with in the warehouse. So the locations needed to be within the same space, perhaps 
four rows of shelving and file cabinets instead of four different rooms, which is what we had had at the original location we were moving from. So, you know, some of the choices that we made worked uh, initially and some did not. You know, we learned some lessons. Next. The second priority, going to the shared facility, this was really about, uh, I think this was a little bit faster. There were a lot of complaints that we heard from stakeholders about not being able to access some of these resources and we really had to beg everyone's patience and understanding because we had to really be diligent with our process to make sure that we had everything documented properly. Uh, so we used, Alma. we used Alma at the SCF and LMS. So we had some things that were already taken care of. They were already digitized. They were already there. That was perfect. But, you know, we could email a box back and forth, which was great. But, you know, emailing back and forth for five years, you know, nobody really wants to do that. So um, all of the new barcodes that we created on the new boxes had to be put into Alma. And we had to create uh, several thousand bibliographic entries for all of these and so that was just a minimum of the, you know we had to get the title <laughs> the author and all, you know and put all of these things in the barcodes and it was just a very labor intensive process uh, yeah, but we wanted to make sure we had that all preserved and closed and no one could see all these things when they were completed so we created a catalog for all of them and we were then we were able to close everything up and prepare it for movement public view is like is impressed for now. Which and the public view had to be put on hold for now because we had to complete our inventory. So there were over 10,000 items. items that we had to account for. Some were some of the largest parts of our collection had up to 450 boxes just in the one piece of the collection. So we had sorry different bar different barcodes and item labels for all of these artifacts. And when we created the spreadsheet and used Alma and API to transfer all of these uh, records, we were able to upload the barcodes very quickly once we did that pre-work. And then it worked very quickly. Uh, the transfers were very seamless. But altogether, it was about 10,000 records that we transferred. And I think it took us a total of about four to five months to complete. And then once that piece was done, then we were ready to set up some circulation, circulation desks so that folks could have access again, which you know, I, I do thank God that uh, GW University was going through the same thing at the same time because they had a special collection there too and with their annual presentations and when I watched their presentation of what they were going through it really helped um, for to give me a, a point of contact that I could reach out there so we could collaborate and kind of share some lessons learned with GW so that was a real um, a win for us and it was uh, incredibly helpful to go through that with them and once we made some changes to our process based on some things I learned from them we were able to see that there were some specific materials in some boxes if someone needed to make a request for a particular item um, that was on campus we would give them a time limit of about two business days turnaround for those requests and you can see here that this is two business days two business days for the SCF as well. The warehouse, we could get you know things on campus perhaps in one business day if we needed to, but the turnaround time was typically two business days. And people seemed very satisfied with that. So I think, also I think the mindset was different during COVID anyway, so that was working to our favor. You know, it's not like, the uh, you know prior to COVID when people would be on campus and they would expect immediate access to the resources for their research and other needs. So we just continued that process and kind of leveraged that uh, mindset so that we could get the uh, behaviors, you know, the expectations to that two business days. And I think people were more understa understanding during COVID anyway, perhaps. So we, we did um, get a lot of support from our stakeholders to implement that. And then we applied that to the archives pass, archives. Ar or excuse me, archive space, and we uploaded our findings 
so that we could barcode everything and track everything there too so that it could be searchable, any donations that we received or other collections go through that cycle, go through that same cycle and that same process. And of course this process has not been smooth, it's not been without its challenges, but I think uh, definitely having the courier service supporting us, that was a big help. The design book between all members of the uh, consortium. consortium has also been critical to our success. I think knowing what we need to put in the boxes, all the collaboration we've been able to leverage with others in the community and in the consortium, you know, what's the maximum size for a box? What if we have to go pick something up and bring you back to campus? You know, all of that back and forth engagement and dialogue, you know, we've made a lot of adjustments as we've gone on and learned a lot. But honestly, uh, still, I think you're, you're never going to avoid some people complaining with the two business days. I mean, that's just how people are, you know, but we do the best we can. So uh, patrons have mostly been understanding, but uh, they don't like to wait. So a total of five or six months worth of work. And so far, I have to say, uh, putting the, the resources that we have in the shared facility in the warehouse, um, all together, I think we've, it's been almost a year for all of these elements, so I'm really happy with the success we've enjoyed in this uh, project. So that's my piece. Turn it over to Jim. Thank you. So, how's it going now? Well, obviously you can see we've had some challenges along the way, but we've tried to convert those challenges into opportunities into how we operate and manage our collection. There's some pros and some cons to the current uh, system. You can go to the next slide. So of course, as Paige mentioned, people will always complain. But so far, it's been a pretty good job of complaining or turning those complaints into uh, positive changes for our institution and for the community. Um, so we uh, you know, encourage that, that process as we are moving to this new home. And our community is very vocal and very supportive of our work as well. So um, we've been pushing hard to make sure that we can get back on campus in a timely manner. This has also allowed us to develop a stronger relationship with our c the consortium, with the WRLC. Um, so for about 30 years now, we've worked in collaboration with them. And we have many members on committees relating to uh, shared expertise and continuing uh, collections. I think it's CCS, right? I can't, can't remember the acronym for it. It's, there, it's an acronym of some kind. Um, so we're very heavily involved with the consortium's activities and have been for a long time. Um, but this is the first time that we've really been in their offices and had like weekly meetings and discussions with them. Um, that's really been beneficial to us and to our future with the consortium. It's also changed how we operate in a few other ways. So as was mentioned, there's the two business uh, day turnaround trade-off. Uh, that's what we call it. Um, so yes, people uh, don't really like that. You know, in the past they could come in and say, "Hey, I want to see this box of stuff." They could get it, or, you know, go through it for the one specific thing, and um, say, "Oh, it looks like there might be something interesting in this other box. Could you get that one?" And so we'd say, "Okay, sure," and we'd you know retrieve the materials for them. Um, so. It was just kind of an impulsive uh, type of spur of the moment uh, thing. So we had lost that with the two business day turnaround time. Um, but at the same time, that's helped our researchers become more efficient with their process because they have to plan everything in advance. Um, so for example, we frequently get researchers from all over the world, really. We've had researchers from the UK, from France, from China, um, Poland. From Poland, right. Yep. So all of this, they had already had to plan for their time in the US. They had a really strict like itinerary um, and schedule that they were tr trying to follow. So now all of the researchers have that same experience. And that's really caused researchers to become uh, more motivated um, to do uh, online work or you know, remote virtual work, and then to communicate with us before coming to campus. So overall, that really has improved the experience for the researchers. In terms of the impact on staff, 
Um, as I mentioned before, the commute is one negative, that's one downside. I think most everybody's become used to it now at this point, um, but some of the uh, staff have uh, different um, think ag agreements based or arrangements based on their work. Um, if they don't need to be there on campus on specific you know days or times, um, they can do some work at our warehouse or telework. Um, so that's really a better uh, opportunity for everybody, more equitable way of doing things. So in terms of the impact on our campus support services as well, um, Gallaudet has never had our archives off campus before. Um, we've had our you know, on-site campus locations and that's been it so far. Um, so we have you know, IT people building security and facilities operations that we've had to uh, figure out now. Um, if you know the internet goes out, who do we call? Um, who manages the like custodial services, the cleaning? So we've gone through a lot of negotiations with that, and luckily our you know campus has also taken that as a learning opportunity. So it has been one thing we've been able to spin into a positive. It also has had a profound impact on our operations. We've become more focused on emerging technologies that will allow us to manage our collection better. So archive space um, has you know, also allowed us to figure out how we can consolidate a lot of our management and archives and records in one place, um, keep that all together. At the same time, we're also developing new uh, digital repositories that has a heavy focus on video and film. Um, as you could assume, we have got a lot of deaf individuals on campus at Gallaudet University. So the focus is really heavily on uh, basic education, both for English and ASL. So a lot of our historical documents are actually on video. So we're developing a new digital repository that's compatible with that format. And in all these different ways that we've prepared our collection for transfer um, has you know, really improved our, our understanding of, of, these items, of these things. So currently there is a donation backlog. Uh, it's the little demon on my shoulder that won't go away, keeps nagging at me. <laughs> I'm like, I know, I know. <laughs> Um, we're uh, you know, a number of years behind in that. So moving our collection has allowed us to take a look at it in a lot more detail and really think about what we're you know, facing and how we can approach that. So the transfer of the archives really helped with that examination process in looking over our collection and thinking about how we can approach our collection in a way that's efficient and successful. And the end result is that you know, some items have been donated several times over decades, but they're you know, spaced out in, you know, in time. So for example, maybe like personal papers of an individual. So we've got to think about how we're managing the collection in that way. We have had, we've got to think about deaccession as well um, and consolidation and that consolidation process. So there's a couple of additional things that we've you know, had to really ask the hard questions about what do we do with these materials? Where can they live? Where should they go? And those sort of things. So we really have a broad collection policy that's been in place for about 40 years. So we really needed to do a deep dive and audit of our, our system to understand what sort of um, you know, intellectual uh, like rights we have over the items in this collection. And then looking at it also in the broader context of the institution. I uh, think Gallaudet, like many other institutions, it goes through cycles of reorganization and restructuring, uh, moving and renovation. Um, We'd had to move from a location before uh, where all these files had been kept for 30 years. And then you know, just suddenly we had these 30 years worth of files. And the, they said, oh, here, take it. We're, we're out of space. So for example, in the picture, as you see here, 
Um, this is from our registrar's office. This is 160 years worth of student records in this collection. 789 boxes. And two weeks ago, they were like, hey, can you please take this off our hands? <laughs> well, where can we put it, <laughs> right? So it really allows us to take a look at how we plan for things and how we use our space. In terms of on campus, what we got to think about what sort of space we want to work in. Off campus, in the warehouse space, uh, we used to be spread out in a couple different rooms. It was easy to overlook things, like mold growth, for example. Um, now we have one large space where we can see the entire collection. If any problems arise, we can immediately identify and address it. So we wanted to apply those, uh, principles. those principles to our new space on campus as well. So again, if you're thinking about moving your archives, don't. <laughs> but if you have to, um, take the, the opportunity, take these opportunities as they arise. All right, uh, any questions? Yes. Got a mic run out to you. Hey, um, question about, uh, you're talking about donations and how uh, you've trying to limit the amount of donations that are coming into your collection. A lot of people who want to donate think that those items are precious because they're theirs, but may not have intrinsic value for the future, probably need to go to the trash can instead of to a, a repository mm -hmm. to you guys or whatever. What types of things did you do to change that and how do you pro share that with an individual who you say, no, we don't want that? So part of our approach has been a strict policy against unsolicited donations, uh, where people freely contact us and say, hey, I've got this stuff to donate. Um, it, you know, If they're free to do that, we're also free to say, uh, no, thank you, we don't need that, or, or it may be better off at this, this other place or another collection. So we do have a strict screening policy in place. And our, our alumni, you know, we, we love them. We had our homecoming last week. It was uh, so much fun. Um, a lot of people wanted to donate items to us. Um, we have uh, six copies of a full run of our yearbooks, for example. We, we don't need more. <laughs> so we're trying to approach it that way with our community and as transparently as, be as transparent as possible with it. Um, sometimes people don't know what we already have. We don't realize that we already have all these things in the collection, and then when they realize that, they'll say, oh, okay, well, that's fine. Um, some people you know, accept that. Um, with some people, it's, it's not so easy um, to, to accept that. So typically, we'll just say, uh, look, I, I, you know, I can't throw this, these things away. Um, or the, the, the person who's donating that will say, I can't throw these things away. Can you, you know, dispose of them for me? So we'll say, okay, I, I guess we'll do that. Um, so I think the important thing is re just really communication with the community. That's the key, is just to have that open dialogue and communication. Um, any other questions? Yes. So if I understand um, correctly, there's a desire to once again have on-campus storage. Um, how developed mm -hmm. are plans on that? Well, there's an ongoing debate on campus in regards to that. We only have so much uh, space available, and there's several projects on campus you know, that are on the to-do list. But we also need to think about funding as well. So the timing early is tough. Um, this project took us two years to get to the point where we're actually off campus. 
Um, so it's, this is not something that you know we can just do spur of the moment or last minute. If somebody approaches us and says, "Okay, we're ready to break ground next month," and like you know everything can be uh, moved back over, we can't just up and, and do that. So we have that risk of you know having to wait for the funding to come through for the university, getting a design, breaking ground on the facility, and everything being prepared to, for us to move back uh, back in. Um, and contract terms are not always uh, extendable. Or, so we're a little bit kind of, we're just waiting for the university to communicate some decisions to us for the on-campus building projects. Um, actually, last week they did announce that we will be coming back on you know, campus in 2025, and the current building will be renovated and we'll be moving back into it. So it seems like we will be moving back to campus, and we really do want to be there. We love our community. We like people coming to speak with us and uh, discuss our, our items with us. DC has a very large deaf community, and m many of the individuals here graduated from Gallaudet. Um, Frederick, Maryland also has the State School for the Deaf um, there, and they're a very active community as well. So this really is the largest concentration of, of deaf population in the world. Um, so we have a lot of visitors, a lot of people coming, wanting to chat with us, a lot of historians and researchers. Um, so we want to be close to our collection and close to our community as well. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, over here. Thank you. I have a question about your emergency management protocols. Um, how have they changed from being in multiple locations to being in one open location, which can be a blessing and a curse when you have all of your items in a large room where everything can be affected? Can you talk a little bit about the differences and changes that you've made? Yes, sure. So we have had a disaster management in place since about 2010. And that's our, still our current plan, but we are in the process of updating that to our current spaces. Um, Gallaudet University as an institution as well is um, reevaluating their policies for how we respond to disasters and crises. Um, we've got a team responsible for uh, like crisis and disaster management on campus as well. Um, Jared and I went to the uh, disaster management training at uh, GW uh, this summer um, through the consortium. And we learned a lot of good information about how you can manage a disaster scene, uh, document everything, and get that reported and recorded. So for that, we really want to leave it to the professionals. Um, we're really focused on a plan for arriving on the scene and you know, documenting and doing that, that damage control um, as soon as possible, and then allowing the professionals to take over from that, that point, um, whether that's you know, the fire department, um, police, or whoever, whatever emergency services. Collection and uh, services. You know, collection care services, for example. Um, we have a lot of vendors as well that we're in uh, the process of reaching out to and negotiations with for that as well. Any other questions? Yes. Have you, um, have you found that there is one particular collection or a couple collections or a particular type of item that, boy, you really wish you could have on campus because that's what people you know, re whether it's researchers or students, you have to keep going to time and time again to get information. Yes, we've got several um, high contact collections in our archives. One thing, people are typically surprised to find out, um, we're often used for genealogical research so we have one collection of papers um, from uh, schools for the deaf. Um, that's the entire history, like all of those those papers that we have on record. Um, that can be really important for people researching family history. So we often get uh, requests for that, probably on a weekly, at least monthly basis. Um, we have our photo collection as well. That's a very uh, high use item. People depend very heavily on our historical photos for a variety of reasons. 
and you know culture or, uh, classes for research onto into deaf history and culture and such. Also, I would just add that you know things are you know we're changing as campus is changing, so we're trying to keep you know our specific undergraduate catalog. Uh, you know that that's been under revision constantly, and we didn't expect that. Uh, we didn't really in it kind of plan for that kind of uh, dynamic catalog there with the changes with undergraduate needs. So we're trying to be responsive to the changes on campus as well. And also we're working to mitigate that through digitization of our larger collections in that way. So a lot of things are available online now. Um, and that reduces the need for things to be kept on campus. So that's made our lives easier as well. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. All right. Well, uh, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I really, I want to thank them again. This was a really a great presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, hearing from them, um, and uh, so I would like to uh, thank everybody for coming to this uh, second uh, session presentation.